and dear sisters, you are all welcome to one more broadcast of the Life for All Institute general subject, the Word of Life, the Fellowship of Life, and Living Stones for Edification. We are seeing the epistles of Peter in message number 20. Arm yourself with the mind of Christ for suffering. Scripture reading is 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 1 through 11. I just would like to remind you that the Apostle Peter, he was greatly used by God in the church generation from the day of the Pentecost. So he began to understand that the Lord Jesus, who still after his resurrection, he appeared a number of times to his disciples, and he did not, he would no longer appear, and from then on, his presence would be in his word, which, which would come through the apostles. And then Peter began to boldly announce the gospel in Judea and in Jerusalem, and always he with the other eleven, they are the twelve apostles of our Lord Jesus, and they began to supply the word, of course, the spokesperson was Peter, Peter always walked with John, and after he had done this wonderful job in the beginning of church history to the Lord use him and open the, the, the door of the church to also to bring in the Gentiles who also be, began to believe the Lord Jesus this happened in Cornelius house and from then on the church is formed by the Jew the believing Jews and the day of the Pentecost and also in Acts chapter 10, the Gentiles who believed in the Lord at the house of Cornelius. From then on, we see the gospel and the church prospering in the region all over Judea. Yet, we see that after the appearing of some were from the the sect of the Pharisees, or the leading ones among the Juda Judaisms, they also began to believe the Lord Jesus. Some of them defended that they could not leave aside the tradition of the Jews, the law of Moses, and circumcision, so on and so forth. So then, internally, the church in Jerusalem happened a pressure to try to conciliate the gospel of the Lord's coming with the Old Testament practices. And from then on, we saw little by little in the book of Acts, we no longer saw to speak about Peter. And Peter, I mean, when Paul, in his third journey, he appeared in Jerusalem, he was received by the elders in Jerusalem who were led by James. And there were already dozens of thousands of Jews who believed Jesus, but they were all zealous of the law, by the law of Moses and could no longer see the presence of some of the apostles, and then Peter was no longer there present. Peter only appeared now when we read his epistles. In First Peter, he wrote the first letter in Babylon. And now, in his second letter, we will see that 
Traditionally, it, it is recognized that he wrote it in Rome. So Peter began to tend and shepherd the Jews who believed in the Lord Jesus, yet they were spread out, or scattered around the world and the nations. This is, uh, in his epistles, the emphasis on his epistles. That is why still in chapter 3, the last message, I spoke a little bit during the last two live broadcasts on Thursday and on Saturday. And then chapter 3 in verse 13. Uh, even if you suffer because of righteousness, you are blessed. Do not be afraid with his threats. Do not be alarmed. Who is he who will harm you because followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. Do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having good conscience, that one day defame you as evildoers. Those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. I said, especially yesterday's live broadcast, I said that while the Jews, or Jews as Christians, living among the nations, there are always some discomfort because Jesus himself, he said in John chapter 15, let us turn to John chapter 15. In regards to the church, the church is left to live in the world because we still need to fulfill the will of God while we are living here in John chapter 15 and verse 18. If the world hates you, you know it, you know that it had hated me before, it hated you. If you were of this world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. And in chapter 17, Jesus says, once again, his prayer to the Father, at verse 13. But now I come to you in these things that speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Therefore, brothers and sisters, because of the fact that we are not of the world, we have a different life from the men in the world. We have our habits and customs that are different. For example, today on Sunday morning, instead of everybody doing what they do or rest at home, we are here. We are here seeking the Lord's word, fellowshipping with the saints. So our life is different of the world. For example, we do not we're not part of the worldly events. So to a certain extent, we can be suffer some prejudice while we are living on this world. Sometimes for people to justify themselves, because many times our situation as Christians ended up exposing them as light for people who are still living in darkness. So people to justify themselves, they began to speak evil doing and to slander that is why these Jewish Christians they suffered uh, prejudice besides of living in a foreign country as foreigners but also as Christians 
Well, this can also happen among us. Yet, brothers and sisters, this may happen. This, uh, this, this prejudice because of the religious standards of Christians are living. I cannot do this because I'm a Christian. My religion will not allow me to do this or that. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the ways of this prejudice. But on the other hand, I'm not referring. It's not good to suffer prejudice for religion, right? It's it's good to to have this uh, because we have a different kind of living, but a living of joy, right? A living of the world cannot have it. If we're suffering, if we're living a life with the spiritual reality, people, our neighbors, our colleagues will always see that we are always filled with hope. We are people full of hope, always rejoicing. We are those who are always in peace, even in hardships. People will see that we are different. And people will see that we are different, so they will one day come and ask us, what is the reason of the hope that you have? You are always rejoicing. You are always rejoicing. You are always in a manner full of peace, in a conduct full of peace when they ask. Here in verse 15 we read, always be ready to answer for those who ask you the reason of a hope which is in you. This is the best way. There is no reason for you to, there is no need for you to preach the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You can simply say, to them, may I pray for you? And then you can get a point in the immersion of the word, pray with people. Certainly people will be touched because the Spirit is working in them and invite them, make sure to invite them to a church meeting. Say to that person, come and see. Come and see. And brothers and sisters, when they come, and when they see the church filled with life, they're bursting the word with war cries and refined immersion, saints they love the word, that will attract people and many people will be saved because of that. Also I finished my live broadcast in verse 18 also read for Christ, 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. So this is the key point because Christians in general They see the cross of Christ as what the Lord did on the cross for us to receive forgiveness of sins, for us to receive redemption. This is not wrong. Yet, brothers and sisters, the final goal is not just for us to receive redemption, not only the forgiveness of sins, but the final goal of redemption of Christ it is to connect us to God to lead us to God. Because if we are not connected to God, brothers and sisters, forgiveness of sins is something that is on the way. The final goal it is for us to be connected to God, for us to begin to live by God's life, by the nature of God, through the word that is supplied to us. Okay? This is a great difference. Why? Because the great majority of Christians still did not understand that the fall of man was because man chose the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because man wanted to have the capacity to discern good and evil. For what? Because man wants to, to have this self-awareness, this autonomy of living good for God. 
to please God and not to live bad, right? So every man who desires to have the discernment of good and evil is because he wants to live good. He doesn't want to practice evil. Okay? But in Romans 7 we see that Satan really was very cunning. He injected this poison in man who desired to have this capacity of discerning good and evil. He really gave this apparent capacity for every man is living through the discernment of good and evil. But when man tries to practice good, then he realizes that he cannot do it. He does not have the capacity to practice good. But he does not want to do bad, but he ended up doing it. Why? Because sin is already in him when he disobeyed, when men disobeyed God by eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Did you saints understand the trap that the man fell into? Satan promised man to give him a capacity to discern good and evil. And he ate of the tree, made man to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But when men receive this capacity to discern good and evil, men go to try to do good. But he can't do it. Paul says, wretched men that I am, because what I, I want to do good, but I can't do it. The evil that I do not want to do it, I do it. Then I realize, since that I'm not the one who does it, then I realize that there's a, an evil in me that leads me to do good, to do, do bad, to do, do evil. This is the, the sad story of the church, but Christians in general, they continue wanting to do good to please God. I don't know if you realized this distinction. Oh, I need to be a good Christian. I cannot drink, I cannot smoke, I must go to church meetings, I must read the Bible, I must preach the gospel. Why? Because I want to please God. Brothers and sisters, this is the same principle of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Brothers and sisters, a real Christian, it is the one who was brought to God and connected to God and who recognizes that he, in his natural capacity, he cannot do any good at all. He cannot please God. He cannot do the will of God. He needs God's life to do the will of God. He needs the nature of God to live a life that is pleasing to God. Did you realize this difference? But the great majority of Christians, they do not have this understanding, this awareness. They don't know that. So brothers and sisters, we are blessed. What is the way for you to be connected to God and to be able to have this power to, to live a life that is pleasing to God? It is in His Word. That is why, brothers and sisters, we must be the one written in Isaiah chapter 6 to 6, verses 1 and 2. What does it say? Let us turn our Bibles, okay? Isaiah chapter 6 to 6, verses 1 and 2. Perhaps some of you were not here when we first read it. What does it say? Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me, and where is the place of my rest? So David had desired to build a house for God. And we, the New Testament, we, the church, we want to build up the church to build a place for God's rest. But then God will say, wait a minute, I created all of it, the heaven and the earth, I created it, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where's the house that you'll build me a mansion, a castle? No, a temple. No, I do not dwell in a house made with human hands. What is the house that you will build me? This is a good question. And then verse 2, for all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one will I look. That is to say, where do I want to dwell in? I want to dwell not in a physical house. I want to dwell in the heart of man. But this man must have a certain condition. What is the condition? One who is poor and of contrite spirit, 
who trembles at my word. These are the two conditions. Who is the man that has a poor and contrite spirit? The one who does not rely on his capacity of discerning good and evil. The one who does not live by the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The one who does not think that he's capable of doing something for God. Or to be clearer, I said less yesterday in, Ma in Luke, in chapter 18. Let us read it. Luke chapter 18. There was a parable that Jesus said about the Pharisee and the tax collector. In verse 9. And he also spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Brothers and sisters, God does not dwell in the heart of those who trust themselves. Those who think that, that they are righteous and despise others. It is exactly in this heart that God does not want to dwell in. That is why, brothers and sisters, these are the people who were poisoned by the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They think they are capable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Since this is the righteous, the one who considers himself righteous in his own eyes, that God does not want to dwell in the heart of these. And then the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather, rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So, saints, let us keep our spirit always humble. Let us keep our spirit always as the one who do not think that he is righteous, do not think that he is capable. Brothers and sisters, we need the Lord. That is why, brothers and sisters, the one that he sees that he is nothing, he has nothing, he holds on to the word. He clings on to the word. He loves the word with reverence. He dedicates his Revering love to the Word of God. So, brothers and sisters, in those hearts God wants to dwell in. So finally, brothers and sisters, now, in the end of 20 centuries of church history, the Lord is beginning to see in His church some who have this condition. And I hope, brothers and sisters, for us to continue to give the Lord this condition for Him to feel at home for him to do his work, as in fact, brothers and sisters, he is doing. But at the moment that we think that we're capable, then he, he no longer can do his work. So, saints, we must continue in this humble condition, loving the word in a desperate way. Okay? Let me then continue here in the word to, to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh, for the lust of man, but for the will of God. I'd like to remind you that the Apostle Peter wrote this letter to the Jewish believers who lived in the dispersion 
and Gentile nations. They suffered discrimination and persecution because they were Jews and because they were Christians. And Peter encourages them, showing them that suffering is necessary to test their faith. Just as gold is refined by fire in order for them to receive the salvation of their souls. This is back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Peter tells us, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Why? Because Peter has served the Lord while Jesus was on this earth. He served as a natural man still. As a natural man. He was one of the disciples who loved the Lord. He really loved the Lord. He would give his own life for the Lord. He would do all his best to please the Lord. He was impulsive was overreacting, somebody with a strong character, strong temper, but in the eve of the Lord's crucifixion, he promised that even if anyone, everyone would abandon him, he would never abandon the Lord, because he would give his own life for the Lord. And at that night, the soldiers came in to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is still impulsive, pulled the sword, and cut off the ear of the high priest, the servant of the high priest. But when he saw that situation of apparently more than 500 soldiers to arrest Jesus, he saw that he was running a risk of dying. He, as the others, all of the 11 disciples, they ran away and abandoned the Lord Jesus. Not only that, but when Jesus was being judged at the house of the high priest, he was in the outer court of the house of the high priest, he denied the Lord three times. To deny the Lord once, this may have happened, but for a second time, begins to show his inability, and third time, it it digs down that good intention of saying to the Lord, Oh, if Lord, even, even if everybody abandoned you, I would never abandon you. But he denied the Lord three times. And uh, when the rooster crowed, he, he, reali he, 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 he realized that uh, as a natural man, he has no capacity to love God or to serve God or to allow God, stop denying God. So, Peter in his epistle, he shows that this natural man, after receiving God's life and his regeneration, he received a living hope. Now new life entered him. His old life he received with his parents was not reliable. The, he, the new life that he received from God in regeneration gave him a new life. This life will dictate a new story in the new man. Still, he was still bearing the old man. So it was needed for Peter to go through various trials. So this is the vision of Peter in his epistles. So he shows us, brothers and sisters, to all of us, as a natural man, we need transformation. The Lord needs to transform our souls. Where our personality is, where the old man is controlling, it took possession from our soul. And now Christ, with regeneration, he regenerated our human spirit. He began to to dwell in our soul. And Christ wants to transform our soul. 
This is the step of the salvation of our soul. For God to save our soul, brothers and sisters, we need transformation. And for transformation, there's a need for trials. Trials. What are the trials f good for? That is why in verse 7 we read that the genuineness of our faith being more, much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we need trials after trial for what? It, it is like a gold is refined. Our faith our faith needs to make us to go through several trials so God may remove the impurities of the old man that are still in us. The Lord wants to remove the impurities. There's only one way to rem remove impurities in an ore of gold, brothers and sisters. It is by taking this gold to a really high temperature. In a really high temperature, a pure metal, gold, gold is a heavy metal and it decays. And the impurities are lighter, they go up to the surface. And then the goldsmith can remove the impurities. Brothers and sisters, this is what God is doing with us. When we go through trials, when we go through pressure situations, sometimes even because we are fighting for the kingdom of God, we're suffering attacks, moments of pressure, since all of that is beneficial for us. All of that causes God to remove impurities from us. And in this way, brothers and sisters, the value of our faith is increased. The value of gold is increased according to its impurity. Do you understand that? When gold is pure, 85%, there's a certain value. When it gets to 99% of purity, there's a different value. So this added value must increase. So for this added value to increase, you and I, we, we must go through trials. This is what Peter, Peter's emphasis in his letter is in this matter. Not only that, he sees that in a way for God to purify us to transform our soul with the goal of saving our soul and on the other hand he also uses that to tell us brothers and sisters there is a government this trial it is because is in the throne if God is in the throne God first of all he wants to establish his government in his home is his house God wants to first judge those in his house. How will God judge the world if he did not judge his own house yet? Did you understand? This is Peter's concept. So God first needs to, he establishes his throne and his, his government in his own house. And we are under this governmental fire of God in his house. Okay? That is why Peter tells us, well, going back to chapter 4. Arm yourselves, for one. Arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he has suffered in the flesh. What does that mean, brothers and sisters? Since that we are aware that trials are needed in our lives. For what? For the salvation of our soul. Better yet, for the salvation to be revealed in the last time at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So first to get to that full salvation, brothers and sisters, we need to go through suffering. Since we're going through sufferings, let us arm ourselves. Let us be ready for sufferings. This is difficult to share this message, right? I'm speaking about sufferings. Nobody likes to hear about sufferings, right? So, brothers and sisters, but if you are ready, are ready where? Are ready in your mind. And your mind is the leading part of the soul. 
I don't know if you know that the mind controls your mind and your soul controls your being. A while ago I was praying with the saints and I said to them, imagine the power of the mind. For example, if now you inform your body, it's cold. It's cold. When you keep thinking about it, oh, it's cold, it's cold. After a while, you're feeling really cold, right? Oh, it's cold. Oh, they turn the AC in a low temperature. Today is cold, right? But if you nurture your body saying, oh, it's, it's warm, it's warm. Oh, wow. This place is hot, it's warm. You know, your mind influences your body, influences your whole being. Your, your mind, you, if you, uh, you just passed by a sister, the sister did not see you, you may think, oh, she has a problem with me, she did not say hi to me. So imagine, if you keep, a husband and wife are living together during the whole time, if you keep in your mind something, that's it, you end up having problems. Our mind ends up controlling our pain. Therefore, brothers and sisters, what I want to say is really, the mind has this power. But on the other, brothers and sisters, I'm not referring for just to control our minds. If the world is using positive thinking. Oh, let us think positively. No, this is not it. But saints, our mind, praise the Lord, in the current church life that we're living in, our mind is always under the Word. At all times, we're immersing ourselves in the Word. At all times, we are hearing the Word. Our mind, praise the Lord, is always under the control of the Spirit, the control of the Word. So, brothers and sisters, on the one hand, I'm for my mind, that I must be ready for suffering, but I'll not be using my own capacity to bear sufferings. But I want to set my mind on the Spirit and under the control of the Word. When you are ready, you suffer less. Did you realize that? When you're ready, it may be that you not even go through sufferings. You're so ready that you don't even suffer. You cannot even realize it when some, some trials come. You, do you understand? Because the Spirit is with you, the Word strengthens you, you do not even realize sufferings. Saints, this is what Peter is trying to say here. So Peter encourages us, as, since all trials are needed, Christians need to be ready for suffering arm themselves with the same mind of Christ because the mind is the leading part of the soul. I said that, right? Romans 8, 6. Let us turn just to, to prove what I said. How our, our mind is in charge. Control. Romans 8, 6. Verse, in verse 5 we read, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, but the question is, what does it mean for you to be carnally minded or set your mind on the things of the flesh or the things of the Spirit? What is for you to, to set yourself? That is why the next verse shows us clearly but for to be carnally minded, carnally minded, better translated, like your mind set on the flesh is death. Your mind set on the spirit is life and peace. In other words, how come my person sets on the mind or sets on the spirit? It is with my mind, right? For me to be carnally minded, that is, I just set my mind on the things of the flesh. If I want to be spiritually minded, I have to set my mind on the things of the Spirit. Do you understand? 
So our mind has a decisive power. A mind will define which side you are leaning on to. Okay? This is what I wanted to show you. And in verse 14, we read, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. That is why whatever I set my mind on, if I set my mind on the Spirit, if I set my mind on the Spirit, I am led by the Spirit. Do you understand? How will I be able to set my mind on the Spirit? This is the most practical way. With the Word, right? If I set my mind on the Word, I set my mind on the Spirit. Though the Spirit begins to guide me. The Spirit begins to, to govern over me. This is God's government. And our transformation also takes place with the mind, begins with the mind. Look at the importance of the mind. Romans chapter 12. And verse 1 speaks of the body. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So the body, in verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul in Romans speaks of the need for God to transform us. But the transformation is transformation of what? The transformation of my soul. My soul needs transformation. But the transformation of my soul begins with what? begins with my mind. So, transformed by the renewing of our mind. How come my mind can be renewed? With the Word. It all goes back to the Word. The Word can renew my mind. My mind is an old mind of the old man. Thinks like everybody else does. Everyone in the streets are thinking, but one day the Word, when I'm immersing on the Word, the Word began to influence my mind, right? The Word began to renew my mind. And with the renewing of my mind, I opened the door for the transformation of my soul. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. How am I able to be freed from the earthly nature which is still in my flesh, still in my old man? Let us begin here in chapter 3 verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. If we are dead with Christ, if we died with Christ, if we resurrected with Christ, isn't that a nonsense to be thinking on earthly things, on the things of this earth? So, how am I able, brothers and sisters, to seek the things from above, to seek the things from on high. That is why in verse 2 we read, Set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. And verse 2 gives us this hint. How will I be able to, to seek the things above? In verse 2 we read, Use your mind. Set your mind where? Set your mind on the things above. How will I be able to set my mind on the things above? With the Word. Once again, it's the Word, right? So do you realize that with the mind, the mind has this power. Determining where my person will be leaning to. So, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, as our life appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. Okay? 1 Corinthians 
chapter 6, verse 17. When we set our mind on the Spirit, we begin to be joined to the Lord. Verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one Spirit with Him. So, in the same manner, in the matter of sufferings, the victory begins in our mind. To have the same mind of Christ who suffered. That is to say, to set our mind in the Spirit, to be joined to Christ. When you are joined to Christ, brothers and sisters, sufferings of Christ will make you to bear your own sufferings. Do you understand me, right? So the ones who are armed for suffering, it is ready, but not necessarily will, have, will go through sufferings. Will have, but you're ready to say, no, but I, I, didn't, I did not have it, but yeah, I'm ready, right? I hope it doesn't come. And who, the ones who suffered in the flesh left sin, you may understand, may understand that asceticism, right, the one who suffered in the flesh left sin. So unfortunately, some think, oh, so I'll, I'll make my, my flesh to suffer. I will no longer eat. I'll stop eating. You know, there's a true fasting. And the fasting and asceticism, these are things altogether different, differently. I don't know if you understand me. One thing is to fast because you're so concerned with God's affairs, with the situation. You're not even, a, you're not even uh, hungry for food. And then you, you fast for the things of God. Another way, it is a fasting, brothers and sisters trying to make your flesh to suffer, my body to suffer, for me to be freed from sin. Saying, brothers and sisters, this is asceticism. This doesn't work. And then, the whole body of uh, monasticism begins. For people are trying to be monks in the Middle Age, or even before that. So then I'll cause affliction to my body. I will take a sharp uh, object and cut up my body for what? For me to be freed from sin. Brothers and sisters, this is monasticism. It's asceticism. I'll not sleep on my bed. If I sleep on my bed, it's quite comfortable. I want to be standing the whole day as much as I can to make my flesh to suffer and then I will stop committing sin. Brothers and sisters, this concept lasted many centuries. It still is in the mind of people. But this is not the right concept. God does not want you to make your body to suffer to stop sin. This is not the point. The point it is, brothers and sisters, that when we are going through sufferings, brothers and sisters, at this moment, it is quite normal for you to go to turn to the Lord. That is why there's a saying that goes like this. I think it's a proverb, right? That I say it. It's better to be part of a funeral than a wedding feast, right? Because in the because in the funeral you reflect on your life, right? In the wedding you have dissoluteness. In this sense, brothers and sisters, when you go through some suffering, it tends you to to do what? To turn to the Lord. It makes you to turn and reflect on your life, your, if it, your life is worth it to live in this way, it is worth it, or, or do I need to consecrate myself to the Lord more? So do you understand? In this sense, it's not in the sense of asceticism, but in the sense of turning to the Lord, for the Lord to take control of your life again. In this sense, this sufferings, it, it is worth it. So you know that in general, A good life, you know, tends to, when a, a good life tends to warm up our lusts. And 
sufferings make you to grow cold. When you are having a good life, everything is easy and wonderful, so on and so forth, you tend to uh, to, 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 to be more slack off, you know, but if, but if you're going through sufferings, usually you turn to the Lord, Lord, this is a good moment for me to reflect on my life, to ponder on my life, Lord Jesus, I want to, to do your will, I want my life to be worth it in doing your will. This is the sense that Peter tells us. Sufferings also encourages us at the time that we, we are still in the flesh not to live according to the lusts of men, but to live in doing the will of God. That is, every time that you go through any sufferings at all, remember that the Lord wants you to, to your life, to be doing the Lord's will. Okay? Let me read what I prepared for you. An easy life and tranquil life may lead us to a life of lightness according to the sufferings and to a licentious life according to the lust of the flesh. In addition, it can make us useless in relation to the will of God. Let us remember that we are redeemed with a price to do the will of God. In other words, we are here alive to do the will of God. But many times we are lost, especially when everything's going well. We ended up slacking off, being a bit, a bit more licentious towards lust, and we get lost a little bit. And the, the Lord recall us to allow us to go through some sufferings. I was bought with high price to do the will of God. In verse. 3. Let us continue there. In chapter 4 and verse 3. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Brothers and sisters, that was the life of the Gentiles in the past. In the past, many walked in doing the will of the Gentiles. Peter referred to these Jews, these Jewish believers. They walked doing the will of the, the Gentiles. Let me read it here. Let me read for you little by little. We walked in lewdness. What does lewdness mean? Let me try and use some synonyms for you to understand it. Lewdness in Greek here means uh, luxury, lascivious behavior, excess, licentiousness, lachery, obscenity, and next up we have uh, lusts. This word is related to sexual desires. Drunkenness here refer to binge drinking. And the drunken state and Revelries. Sorry. The time as a student, revelries, they just go to unrestrained merrymaking, you know, festivities. No drinking parties, it's a binge drink. And abominable idolatries. A description of the lust of man in which this man lived in. So now they left this vain way of living. Since now they have left away the Gentiles, your friends begin to su be surprised. 
but all of a sudden you no longer uh, compete with them in the same excess of debauchery in verse 4. In regard to these, they think it is it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation. They were all friends, they all went to parties, they were all for lewdness, to be drunk in debaucheries. All of a sudden, they believed the Lord Jesus. They began to no longer practice those things, so their f their friends think that this is strange. In verse five, the unbelieving Gentiles they thought it was strange. No longer followed them from the strength. They no longer accompanied them in the revelries in the debauchery of men's passions. Excessive debauchery can be understood. I'm trying to show you the original word here, okay? It's understood as a torrent, as a tide that drags man toward complete moral degradation. You know that sometimes one follows the other, they are swept away like a tide. They sweep away everybody in this immorality. So the change in life those who believe bother those who follow the road and vain way of life. The weapon of darkness that they use to defend themselves from immoralities is to resort to defamation and slander. I don't know if you realized, I think in chapter 2, in chapter 2, in verse 1, do you remember? Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. When I spoke of this verse, I said that it begins with wickedness, malice, and the end in evil speaking. So the ones who are practicing evil, they go through all this process of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, ends up in evil speaking, which is slender. What does that mean? Those who are practicing evil, all of a sudden your friend is no longer practicing evil. And they will feel bad. For, they feel bad because the conduct of his friend who is no longer practicing evil exposes him. You realize this one is now in light and exposes darkness. So for me, to kind of defend myself, to justify myself, to continue in my uh, situation, I have to slender him. So slender, evil speaking, it is a tool for people to justify themselves of their situation of darkness. That is why Peter tells you not to worry about those things, because they do not realize but you will render accounts in verse 5. Let us read it. In regard to these, the things. Verse 5, 4 5. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel is preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but living, live according to God in the spirit. So, brothers and sisters, we, when we were in this lust, walking with the Gentiles, we did not know that one day we have to, there is somebody who will be judging and we have to give an account. But now we know, that is why we have to live as the one who has to give an account. One day, so the Peter's context. Peter wants to show that somebody is in the throne. We are under God's government. We cannot just do anything. God is in the government. We have to uh, to give an account to him because he is he's gonna judge the living and the dead. So nothing will go unpunished. 
say, oh, but the one who's practicing unrighteousness, nothing happens to him, but I'm, I'm being righteous and this happens to me, that happens to me. No, be aware that nothing will be unpunished, will be left unpunished, because there's one governing. So the living, those who are living will be judged before the millennium. Let us read Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. So, he will be judging both living and the dead. Who are the living? Those of the Lord's coming will still alive. This judgment in Matthew 25 that I just began to read, you can read to the end, 246, okay? This judgment it is for those who are alive at the Lord's coming. What about the dead? The dead will be judged where? I don't refer to Christians. We in the church. It is a different judgment. We are already being judged. People in the world, if they remain alive, they will be judged. Here in Matthew 25, verse 31. What about the dead? Let us read. Revelation chapter 20. People in the world who do not believe the Lord Jesus, when will they be judged? Revelation chapter 20 verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was no, there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, those who were dead in the sea will also be judged, and death and hate is delivered up the dead who were in them. Those who were already in Hades, who died and were in Hades, will also be brought back for judgment. And, and death and hate is delivered up were in them, and they were judged. And they were judged, each one according to his works. That is, nothing will go unpunished. So then death and Hades will be cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So the living and the dead do, do not believe they will be judged in this way that I just read. And the judgment of Christians already begun in the house of God. Let us read it in First, first Peter, we read that, right? First Peter 4, in verse 17. First Peter 4, 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if begin with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? That I just described for you. So our judgment, it is today. I'd rather to be judged today, not one day, to be caught up by surprise on that, on that day. I'd rather the Lord to judge me, warn me, always when I'm out of line, right? May the Lord to lead me for approval. I want to be approved. Under Revelation, brothers and sisters, John was invited. I read to you Revelation 4, verses 1 and 2. John was invited to go up to heaven to see that in heaven it is set what? Let us read it, okay? Revelation chapter 4. Verses 1 and 2. After these things they looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard 
was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So when John was invited to go up to heaven, when he was invited, immediately he was found, he was in spirit, he was already in heaven, and what did he see? The first thing that he saw, he saw a throne set in heaven. This throne is not empty. This throne, there's someone sitting. Brothers and sisters, our life must be lived aware that we have someone in the throne. God is in the throne. Did you know that many times when I prepare myself to speak for the Lord, I see whatever I am in my bedroom, my office, so on and so forth, I have this habit of bowing down on my knees and to say to the Lord, Lord, I know that you are in the throne. You are in the government, Lord. I am not the head, Lord, you are the head. I am under your headship. I do not dare to do anything outside of your headship, Lord. You know, this is an important concept. This awareness is important. Anything that we do, brothers and sisters, to know that there's a throne in heavens, and in the throne someone is sitting. And more than that, he is judging us, judging us in the house of God still today. Not on that day, but today. So on the other hand, it seems, let me get back to here, it seems a strange thing for him to say the gospel is preached to the dead. You didn't find it strange here? Where am I? Verse 6, right? 4, 6. 1 Peter 4, 6. So the gospel is preached to the dead. So many people do not understand. And then it is still possible my relative who is dead did not receive the gospel and to go and preach the gospel to him. No, that's not the, the, this sense. By the context, you can clearly see that it refers to the believers that in, in Peter's letter, those who already died, the believers who already died, because either they were persecuted, they were tested by God as part of his judgment, as of his house, as 4.17, I read it to you. So it's not possible, saints, someone to preach the gospel for someone who already died. Remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And the rich man said, Oh, now that I see things are like this, so command somebody to go and preach to my relatives. He was informed that it's not possible because they we have to be righteous with everybody. So it's not possible in Hades. That is why we must seek to save as many as we can of people. So that at least they believe the Lord Jesus. And our role also it is to, to bring them to the gospel of the kingdom. To live the church life together with us. So let us preach the gospel. To take as many as we can out of Hades of the session of the unbelievers so that at least they have a chance to have eternal life as we have. So on the one hand, the ones who suffer for righteousness sake in chapter 1 verse 6, 1 Peter 1 6 In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So Peter has this concept that even Christians were suffering, suffering trials. 
chapter 2 verse 12 speaks again having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation speaks of visitation chapter 2 verse 19 just want to show you Peter's concept For this is commendable because of conscience towards God when it is grief, suffering, and wrongfully. This receives uh, chapter 2, verse 20, 25. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So on the one hand, brothers and sisters, on the one hand, we have been judged by God going through sufferings, but on the other, we have been shepherded and tended by the over shepherd and overseer of our souls, our Lord Jesus. Because Peter has this concept that we have God's government on his church to test our faith. The final goal it is for our approval. God wants to approve of us. So they were Christians who lived by the Spirit, where the Spirit of God dwelt, which governed their actions. So let us continue here in chapter 4 in verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So in verse 7, we see, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Brothers and sisters, when we went to Africa, the Lord's coming became even more concrete to us. The continent, the brother Dong, in the year 2000, he dreamed of preaching the gospel of the kingdom to all of that continent, finally is coming true. This conference there, brothers and sisters, we saw the testimonies of the saints in Africa. They are encouraged. They are in line. They are aligned. They love the word. They realize, just like us, but the Word is doing great works, performing miracles and supernatural things among them. They realized that there was this need to do this, to turn around in their church life. They also admitted that they were living a life of routine, in a traditional way, in a conventional way, without fruit. And after the Spirit brought all of that from co-porting, uh, GPCs, the house of co-porters, house of teens, and the prophetic word coming to them, with the immersion in the word, with the daily food, brothers and sisters, so their lives were turned upside down, they made a turnaround, they were in a conventional way, so because nothing was bearing, they were not having fruit, but praise the Lord, they realized that this new way the Lord is doing the church life to come in to place that will change Africa, will be producing many fruits in Africa. Praise the Lord, when we went to Africa, we benefited both the saints in Africa and also visited Africa. All of us were confirmed that really the Lord's coming is quite close. That is why more and more 
we must live a life with sobriety, a life with criterion. Let us not li live just, you know, recklessly. Let us live to bring the Lord black, to, to apply our time, our money, our energy to spend with that, running after the Word, following the Word closely, practicing the Word, will bring the Lord back. This is our desire. That is why, brothers and sisters, let us be sober. And above all these things, brothers and sisters, let us be watchful in our prayers. And above all these things, saints, verse 8, 1 Peter 4, 8, have fervent love for one another. Wait a minute. Before getting to this, I'd like to show you let me read what I prepared for you, okay? I always remember, we're speaking about the TikTok, TikTok, time is passing by. The clock's ticking, but every time that you remember time, time passing by, you have to remember what is the purpose of time. Time is for what? Time serves to do God's will. What is the will of God? God wants Christ to be the head over all things. So every time you hear tick-tock, 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 you must remember. We're still in time because Christ still was not able to have Christ head over all things. So our struggle, it is... For Christ to be the head over all things, first over us, over his church, okay? So, saints, that is why let us not allow time to pass by in vain. And always to remember, brothers and sisters, that we are in the end of church age. Notice that the end of church age will be mixed it up with the re restart of the, the Jewish age, the last week of the end of the last seven years. And we, I believe that we are quite close from this last seven years to happen. When this last seven years happen, someone will be able to put an order, put an order in the world situation. There will be peace, there will be an alliance, the people of Israel will be be able to build their temple, but this peace will be lasting for three and a half years. During this time, the church age, it is already in its end. We are quite close to that. And when it is the end of this three and a half years, great tribulation will take place. Great tribulation will be three and a half years more. This year, these years were not short, nobody will survive. So the overcomers will be caught up before the great tribulation. Because they will be doing the will of God. So we have a few years to complete everything that the, the all everything that the saints in this twentieth centuries have done. We have to uh, complete that. So this is our time. We are in the field. We're not just watching. This player is not playing well. You are. You are the player. You have to play well. Let us bring the Lord back. Because as soon as this age comes to a close, the Great Tribulation will take place, and at the end of the Great Tribulation, Christ will return. What is the next age? The age of the millennium. The age of the millennium is still within time. Why? Because here, only the overcomers got there. The age of the millennium, Christ will rule over all things. When the age of millennium ends, then Christ will give the kingdom to the Father, and then will begin eternity. Well, the, the time will be finished. So while the time is running, because the Lord's will is not done yet, we are here to do God's will, which is Christ to be head over his church. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let me read it here for you. We have to be watchful 
that is to say, of a healthy mind. I'm reading it because I was taking this word in Greek to be watchful here, to have a sober mind, a healthy mind, to to be a good sense that is ability to judge in a balanced way. And what is to be sober? Sober, a healthy mind. To be moderate, be controlled, to dedicate ourselves to prayer. It's in the same sense that Jesus said to his disciples to be watchful and pray in Matthew 26, verse 41. For the spirit is ready, but the flesh is weak. Why do we have to be watchful? Because of our flesh. Our flesh is weak. So we are be always watchful, immersing ourselves in the word, live in the church life, always to be watchful. Let us finish reading the text there. In verse 8, And above all, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Brothers and sisters, until now, Peter was concerned with the way of living of those who received the letter. Yet, we are not called to live a Christian life individually. We were called, brothers and sisters, Peter specify that we are living stones for edification. So it is pointless to be just a good Christian. We have to be a stone to be built up with others. For that, brothers and sisters, the main element for edification it is the love of God. For God is love. First John 4, 8, we saw that when, it, when it, we saw John, Brothers and sisters, I want to say that again to you. I'll not be tired to say that love is the only element that binds us to one another and with God. Love is the only element that connects us, binds us together, joins us together, to get us together with God and with one another. What is to bind us together? It's to build up. Edification, therefore, brothers and sisters, without love is not, not edification. The love of God is paramount for edification. So, saints, love brings us together perfectly. Colossians 3.14 If you, I don't know if I have this version at home, the complete Jewish Bible in Portuguese. Colossians 3.14 Tell us that love joins us perfectly. Love is the only thing that joins us perfectly. Why? Because love is the very essence of God, the very nature of God's life. We are making the word to circulate among us, and in the word there is life. And the life of God, the life of God, the nature of God, the essence of God. Therefore, when we immerse ourselves in the word, circulate the word among us, we receive much love of God, and the love of God in us, brothers and sisters, more and more will be making us to increase the intensity of love to one another. Because when we receive the word of life, in 1 John 1, tells us that we receive a word of life which is the very eternal life, it provides us love and the fellowship of life. The intensity of love among the saints it depends on the intensity of the circulation of life through the word of the Apostle. Because the natural man does not have this love for edification. Therefore, let us more and more to make this word to circulate more intensely. The, the higher the intensity of the circulation of the word among us, the higher love will grow in us and love will be increased, but the love will be increased among us. We'll begin to love fervently one another. Do you believe that? Church in Philadelphia has been produced. Fervent love is possible in today's time. Lord Jesus. So, Saint, that is why Paul says in Ephesians 4 15 and 16. I'm not tired of using these two verses. That's why we must f follow the truth and love in him who is the head, Christ.
Christ. From home, from home, the whole body been joined together, knit together. How the body will be joined together and knit together with love. Without love, there is no joining together, no knitting together. There is no way for us to be knit together, consolidated. It is the love that joins us together. Okay? I'm just speaking again. I don't know if it's a good analogy. Let me use an analogy of a civil engineer. Let us imagine that we are stones, building materials. The building materials have stones, you have sand and iron. And these are all loosened elements in a uh, reinforced concrete. But they put everything in a mold with all the elements. Stone, sand, but you need cement. If you mix it up, all of that with cement and you with water, the right amount, what will happen? Cement will be causing a chemical reaction and will be binding together all the loosened elements into one block, in a solid block. This is what God is doing. The love of God is like a cement. We are loosened stones. Uh, we're loosened, we're not, but with the adding of cement and water representing the spirit, and little by little we will be joined together as one. Intense love comes in this way. We are solidified. The church is built up in this way. Only the church in Philadelphia, brothers and sisters, have these characteristics. The brotherly love, an intense love to one another, which is the brotherly love, Philadelphia, and non feigned love, loving one another with our heart, chapter 1, verse 22 of Peter. Love covers a multitude of senses. You can see that, and James also tells us that. James 5. James chapter 5, verse 20. Is this correct? Yeah, it is correct. It is correct. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way Save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sin. And also Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Now let us finish it with verses 9 and 10. 1 Peter 4, 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as which one has received the gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Each one of us, we are a member in the body of Christ. As a member in the body of Christ, according to the manifold grace we have received, we have a gift. Every life provides a skill of life, right? I already said. A little duck, when is born, a baby duck, is born and it has the life of a duck, but also the skill of a duck. So together with life, you receive a gift. Do you understand? So a duck, a new duck, duckling, when you toss on the water, they can swim because together with the life of a duck, they receive the, the gift of a duck. So you as a member of a duck, you receive grace, right? And with the grace, you receive gift. Ephesians 4, 7. Let us turn quickly. Ephesians 4, 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. You receive 
gift, grace, and the gift. So, Romans 12, 5. So, we being many, Romans, this is correct, Romans 5 and 6, so we being many are one body in Christ, individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them, if prophecy let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Having then gifts differing according to the grace, according to grace we have different gifts. One received the gift of prophecy, another of ministry, another another gift. So each one of us as members of the body of Christ, the Lord, put us in the right place, and each one received the gift to function in that place, right? So we receive this grace to function. It's interesting here. See, if prophecy, uh, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. Here it speaks of the one who prophesy, one who teaches, and the one who ministers. These are three different gifts. Keep that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll see in a, in a minute. So then, we are many members, but one body. We are the body of Christ, and God has arranged, this is the First Corinthians 12. I don't have time to read it all, you can read it at home. God has arranged each member, each one of them in the body, just as He pleased. Not complain to the Lord, Lord, I don't want to be a foot, I want to be a hand. I'm not complain. The Lord arranged each one as He pleased. Let us be hospitable. Let us welcome one another without grumbling. Saints, our home is to serve the Lord. Is your house open to the saints? Is your open to home meetings? To receive new ones and people, brothers and sisters? Let us learn to open our homes establish home meetings to shepherd and feed the new ones and also each other. God has given his church so many riches in his word. Let us dispense such riches as good stewards of the manifold grace of God to one another for the edifying of the church. Well, why did I stop Romans 12? Because I I needed to finish it here. First Peter 1, let us finish it in verse. First Peter 4, 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do as it with the ability with God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the meaning forever and ever. Amen. Here it is quite interesting, brothers and sisters. Peter says, if anyone ministers, let him do it according to the... This is a, a unique word. Peter tells us here, says, do not speak with your own opinion. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Not according to your opinion or biblical knowledge. Who are the oracles of God? Let me see here. Divine utterance. That is to say, according to the word of God spoken by the apostles. This is yet another confirmation that the church follows the same principles of the early church. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship. That is, they did not make up their own words to speak. They were not, one thinking that he was eloquent, another who knew the Bible, that they could speak. The one who speaks, speaks according to 
the oracle of God. What is the oracle of God? God has spoke through the apostles. This is the meaning. So in Romans 12, 6, I just showed you, you will see that there are three kinds of gifts, the one who prophesies, the one who teaches, and the one who exhorts. The three kinds of gifts are related to the word. So let me read a footnote in the recover version to make it clear each one of those things. To prophesy is to speak for God, to manifest God in your speaking under His direct revelation. It's not merely because I have knowledge. This prophesying is, this is the sense, the unique prophesying, okay? To speak for God, to manifest God in your speaking under His direct Revelation. In prophesying, you may keep me including predicting, predicting things, but it's not the, the main aspect of the prophecy mentioned here. To prophesy, it brings the revelation of God for the church, the body of Christ, for the body of Christ to be built up, 1 Corinthians 12, 4. These three, prophecy, teaching and exhortation relates with one another. When he prophesies, speaks of what he received a direct revelation of God. Not based on the one who teaches, instruct others, not based on the direct revelation of what the prophet spoke. One who exhorts does it according to direct speaking of God under God's revelation and the teaching that is according to this revelation. These three kinds of speaking are for the edification of the body. They minister the supply of life to the saints for them to grow together through the word of God. This is the, the footnote. I did not add anything. So if anyone serves, do it in the strength that God provides, for that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Nothing should be done with the strength of men, because our sufficiency comes from God because we are ministers of a new covenant. In this new covenant, brothers and sisters, we do not consider ourselves capable, not even to think of anything, because it all comes from God. What we have to do, brothers and sisters, it is the Word, to closely follow the Word, to ruminate on the Word, to immerse ourselves in the Word, and to practice the Word. In this way, all of the glory will be given to God, because to Him belongs glory and also dominion forever and ever, because He is the one who is sitting on the throne. He is the one who is governing over all of us, and we are all under His government. Amen. This is the word today. May the Lord bless you all. Amen.